want to read our scripture for today, uh, Isaiah, 49th chapter. I'm uh, just going to read a couple of verses for you. Uh, verses 3 and 4 in the 49th chapter of Isaiah. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning, being his servant today, in a, in a continuation of our, our sermon series. And so we're, uh, we'll get to that. But we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing and fellowship, worship him this morning. Uh, and just so if you're a choir member scattered out there, make a joyful noise and make the people around you uncomfortable today with your singing. That's what I want you to do. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we, we hold back or uh, whatnot when we're back out in the congregation. But uh, I want you to raise a joyful noise this morning while we praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today. Let's pray.
You ever had reality set in on you? You ever had just overwhelm you? You, you ever had like a, it's the whole thing when people go on vacation, you come back from vacation, well, I got to go to work now. The harsh reality of getting back to the normal routine takes over. The reality that, boy, this is, I've enjoyed time away and now the reality of the situation is still here. Reality begins to set in. If you'll notice, the subtitle of the sermon is the same as it was last week because this should be the reality that sets in with us every day. We should never walk away from the reality that our sins are forgiven. We should never walk away from the reality of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. Whenever we, we receive communion, that is we are celebrating what he has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. And we are to be reminded as Christians, as the church, that this is the reality in which we live. You see, when I, I, I put that up there and you see the, the phrase, reality sets in, there's always just a negative twinge in the back of our minds when we read that phrase. Reality sets in. We think reality sets in is not a good thing. We, we think the reality when it sets in, we're like, Ugh. oh boy, here it comes. But I want to change that mindset. You see, the entire gospel message that we have, what we've been preaching on the last couple of weeks, is the great reminder that we are not like the world. We don't look at things like the world looks at it. There's oftentimes that necessity that we have to, to relearn some things, to unlearn some things. It might be the better way to say it. To not think about it the same way we used to think about it. To understand that there is a a better way. Now, I want us to think about that this morning and reality setting in. The idea behind it is that we indeed uh, sometimes can be confused by appearances. The appearance of things can be deceiving, and we want to talk about that a little bit this morning uh, in light of the last two Sundays and kind of wrap our minds around this idea that sometimes appearances can be deceiving. And we can think about appearances like the world does, or we can think about them in the context of the life we're trying to live based on these last two sermons. This, this idea that my sins have been forgiven, and that begins to shape my entire reality. That begins to shape everything of who I am, is that he died for me, rose again, sent the comforter. I now live in the truth and knowledge that Jesus Christ loved me so much, loved me so much that he died on a cross for my sins. This is the reality that I now live in. So if you will, Isaiah, the 49th chapter, keep your, keep your Bibles turned there. We're going to go back and read uh, a little bit more of this chapter. Uh, there's much more to it than, than just these third and fourth verses that we're going to focus on today. But in this book, in this chapter, Isaiah is, again, prophetically reminding us that he the prophecy of who the Messiah is. Within this section, the 49th chapter, in the 49th chapter, what we're, what we're seeing here, we're going to begin in verse 1 reading. Verse 1, chapter 49 of Isaiah. And this is, I want you to understand, not so much the words of Isaiah, not so much the words of the Lord, capital Lord being God the Father we think about, but the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is kind of where we're pulling in from in this 49th chapter. So beginning in verse 1, it says this, Listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. And he said, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I've labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, verse 5, 
He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says. The Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, to, who, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. When you read the rest of that, you kind of see. You see Jesus in those words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray this morning that you help us to understand your word. Help us to take it deeply in and be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So appearances can be deceiving. When you look at the third and fourth verses, you see that what is going to be proclaimed and what is being said is is simply this. What, What Jesus is going to experience and we know this from our, our following of his story. We, we know what we're going to get to when we get to the Easter story. We're going to see that what Jesus did didn't match up to what they thought Messiah would be. It, it's not going to, to make sense to them exactly who the servant or what the servant was going to do. So they, they kind of they get confused there. We often get confused by our lives once we accept Jesus as well. Just like we talked about that, oh, I never shall forget if the fire fell. I, I inter- interceded there, and I, I talked about that simply for this statement. We often look at it, and we don't understand. And so we just move on, rather than allowing God to help us to understand what's occurring. So Isaiah is prophetically capturing the words of the servant, Jesus Christ. That's what's happening here in, in this scripture, in these verses. And I want to focus for just a moment about verse 4, because sometimes we also get confused. We look around us and fix our attention around us, and we think, well, this is not going how I thought it would. You ever had that thought in your mind? It's not turned out how I thought it would. I don't think this is how it's planned. I would not have planned it this way. You ever said that? Or, or maybe, maybe, let me phrase it how we'll understand it down here. There's no way I would have called the draw play on third and ten. Now I got somebody's attention, right? Yeah. I never I wouldn't have made that. Oh, can't believe that. I wouldn't have done that, not in a million years. Second guessing, Monday morning quarterbacking. You see, we, we don't understand why, why they're doing it. And, and I will tell you, as a, as a football fan, one of the, the I, I absolutely cannot tolerate how about that well we're going to run this play for a loss just to set something up later oh i can't stand that i think i grew up i grew up too earlier or too too early in life uh with uh, steve spurrier down there at florida where if you didn't stop us we're going to score 90 points we're going to score our goal every play is to score my mind goes back to that great wide receiver from uh, the 49ers, Jerry Rice, and how that in practice, every time they threw him the ball, he ran all the way to the other end zone. Every practice play, it might be a screen, a wide receiver screen, it might be an out route, but when he caught the ball, he ran the ball all the way to the other end zone. And the story goes, that they asked him, why are, you, why are you doing that? He says, because on every play, the goal is to be in the end zone. He just stopped. Yeah, he caught the ball on the 10-yard out, but then he turned it upfield and ran for a touchdown. The idea and the mindset of the appearance of why we're doing what we're doing and what the end result should look like. Now, did Jerry Rice score a touchdown on every catch he made? No, absolutely not. And so one might think his practice was in vain and what he was practicing was in vain and what he practiced didn't actually work in the game because he thought that he would run into the end zone every single time. For those of you who don't know Jerry Rice, look him up. He's out there. Jerry, Judy, I don't know. I don't, they don't practice that way. Jerry Rice, they got to practice that way. Or, or so the folk story goes. These are the words of the servant. The appearance in, chapter, in verse 4, the words say this. I've labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength in vain for nothing. How that starts off that verse. I have labored in vain. 
My effort wasted. The appearance here in verse 4, it appears to be in vain. All my work is in vain. I never, I, if I'd known it was going to turn out like that, I wouldn't even have done it. Right? Let me put it in context. Sunday school teacher prepares a lesson. They spend all week and they, 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 they get extra information. They, they pull it all together and they, they're ready to do that lesson. They show up and there's one person or there's no person. And we should just combine Sunday school classes. And they say, well, if I'd known nobody was showing up, I wouldn't have prepared a lesson. I wouldn't have gone, or, or what, worse yet, let me help you out if you were the one missed class. Or they go, I, do, you know, do you know how hard I worked? I, I slaved and labored over the Sunday school lesson for you, and you didn't show up. Oh, isn't that, can you hear the love? You feel the love in that statement? <laughs> you have put me out. And now I'm ticked. And so you know what I'm going to do next week? I'm not going to prepare. Because none of y'all showing up anyway. Oh, wow. The love just flowing out of that Sunday school teacher. We don't have that person here at this church. Praise God. We don't have them here. But we, we all met them, haven't you? So, some of y'all go, well, I've been here my whole life and I have met them. No, I, all right, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I was in their class for years and years. We, we don't have it, but we, we understand that. It's funny because it's a reality. Because somehow we think that the outcome of faithfulness to God is something the entire world agrees is success. We, we somehow think that instantaneously it's, it's got to be the reality right now. Every time we have to score, every time it has to be an absolute success. Everything we try and we do because we love God and God lives in us is going to be wildly successful by anyone's standards. That's what we think. I just checked. I, Lloyd's, Lloyd's back there. He's on it. He probably knows better than I do. Right before I got up here during the offertory, three viewers on Facebook. Well, why are we doing it for three viewers? We're doing it because of what God called us to do. That's why. I, I want to tell you, it does have something to do with the viewers, whoever might stop by, whoever might see it. But we are not doing it and going to judge it based on whether it's three, it's 10, it's 100. We're not doing it that way. We're doing things because we're being obedient to God. We are his faithful servant. That's the important part. That's why appearances can be deceiving. Appearances can be deceiving. The pastor of a church that's adding, as Acts did, 3,000 a day. I don't know of a church adding 3,000 a day right now. The pastor of a church that's adding people exponentially and on this wild curve and has planted you know, 40 churches and they got sites all over the place is no different in his faithfulness than the pastor in a little country town where there are 12 elderly people and he's walking them on to glory. There is no difference in the obedience and the faithfulness to God. We struggle with that. As pastors, we struggle with that constantly. As lay people, you even struggle with that. I've had people talk to us uh, in times gone by, and, and you know, well, we, we, just, we should have more people. Maybe so, maybe not. Well, I tell you what we should be is we should be faithful to God, and that's what I see. Let's be faithful to God and what he asks us to do. Jesus, Isaiah is saying, these words that we Recognize Jesus. I've labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength in vain and for nothing. But look at the second part of verse 4. Yet, yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. My reward is with my God. In other words, it's not about what we're seeing here. You see, if at every step of Jesus' ministry was being measured by whether Jesus was successful as the Messiah or not, which I, I hard to wrap our heads around when we're going to talk about that, but I want you to kind of get it that way. If we looked at Jesus' ministry and measured everything he did by whether it was a wild success or not. There are a couple times in there where you go, oh, he should never have done that. He should never. And boy, just think about what his attendance numbers would have been and the followers he would have had had he not told them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. (laughs) 
There were some folks that were good, faithful followers of him. And they said, oh, I, I was with you until. And then they checked out. They left. There was a time when Jesus Christ is mystery. People said, I can't, I can't go there. I don't even understand. I, I don't want to think about that, right? Think about his own disciples. By the time we get to the foot of the cross, not a big crowd of them right there front and center, is there? We think about Peter. All that Peter saw, everything he witnessed, and right there he's like, well, I don't even know that guy. We, we say we're going to be different. We say because the Holy Spirit now lives in us, we are different. But those, as the song we picked out today said, those doubts and fears are still there. The wavering can still be there. We have to have God's peace leading our lives. We have to realize that our lives are not being measured by man's standards. Hey, praise God, your walk and your fellowship and your Christian walk is not even being judged by me. I don't have a score. Some, some people might think I got a scorecard at home. A little book. Keeping track, you know. I got a little bar there. It moves back and forth, closer to God, farther from God for each person in the congregation. Right? I move the little, I move the little stick. It's, it's on the wall. It's a little pin clip. Come by my office of the house. That's where all y'all are listed at. You know, I just, I just move them around based on what I saw this week or what I read on Facebook. And I, oh my God, you know. Right? No, it's not. I mean, not y'all got some ideas now, don't you? Oh. There's some, there's some mamas in here just going to put their kids' names on there. Who's loved more? They're just going to start moving that around. The, yeah. Did you talk back to me today? Just move that on, right? You didn't call me. Right? Those things. It's silliness, but we do it that way. We do our whole lives that way. But what, what Isaiah is relaying to us today is, listen, in your walk with God, it's not about what you're seeing going on around you. Because a lot of you are going to go, and, and I, Tandy and I have done this. We have said this, so this is on us. But if you're like us, you said this as well. If you're a parent, we have failed. <laughs> this, brace yourself. This might be my fault. I, I'm looking. Oh, yep. Okay, that one's on me. Or as Tandy says, that one's on you. you know, right? And, <laughs> yeah. This is. Yeah. 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 We, We've been, we've experienced that, but we take that on. I want to tell you, that doesn't define us. Praise the Lord. You as a parent, your kids don't define your walk with God. Woo! Yeah, I, maybe that's an encouragement to somebody other than just me today, right? Yeah. Nothing, again, now you're thinking, well, what are the kids doing? Some of you are distracted for the rest of the service. I wonder what his kids are doing now. Hmm. Why are they that illustration? That seems odd. No. <laughs> the idea is this. It appears to be vain, but the end result is not measured here. The end result is not measured by what we see and how the world measures things. It's different because it, it goes back to this. Are you his servant? Are, are you a servant? It's the question we have to answer today for a few minutes. Are you God's servant? You see, this in Isaiah is the servant of God talking. You see, it's not going to look right, but see, I'm not, the servant is not in charge of the master's plan. The servant follows the master's plan. Jesus himself continually told us, I do nothing apart from the Father. I am here to do the Father's will. I am here to be obedient. Not just as an example for us, but that is who he is. That is to be a follower of God, is to be a servant of God, to be obedient to him. Are you a servant today? I want to talk about that in, in light of our, our list for just a couple minutes with you. you. You see, if you're a servant with him, if you're a servant, think about this. If I serve you, then when you tell me to do something, I do it. I, brace yourself. I don't know, maybe you all don't have a Webster's Dictionary at home. Maybe not even have an app on your phone. But, but to serve, so to be a servant is one who serves. If you're serving someone, you have to be near them. You have to walk with him. If you're serving him, you have to be obedient to him. You can't be disobedient and be a servant. You, you simply can't. You're obedient. 
You do his will. You do what he desires. You, you follow him. All, all of this is part of being a servant. When I don't have those characteristics, when I don't walk close to God, if I don't speak to him, if I'm not obedient to what God says, and if I'm not doing his will, then I'm not his servant. I'm my own master at that point, serving myself, my own desires, my own needs, not his. I can't, I cannot, it's why in scriptures we have, you cannot serve two masters. You can't do it. There is no espionage in our walk with God. We're not a double agent for Satan. We shouldn't be. How about that? Maybe we are. Maybe somebody in here is struggling with that one. We can only serve one master. We can only be a servant to him. So let's go back to our list. You've had this for a while. I'm going to kind of get this in your minds. By now you know it. We're Christ-centered. We're spirit-filled people. We're soul-seeking people. We're compassionate and we're generous. This is kind of who defines us. We're, we're, we're really kind of anchoring ourselves in this today. We're Christ-centered, spirit-filled, soul-seeking, compassionate, generous people. So what does that look like in light of being a servant? Pretty simply put, if you're Christ-centered, if Jesus is the center of your life, if he's the center of your universe, if he's the most important thing to you, then that makes you a servant. You serve him. If it's Christ-centered, that's who you're serving. If you are self-centered, then you are your own servant. You're your master. If you are, I'll, I'll talk to me. If my whole universe and world revolves around the Chicago Cubs, if when I wake up in the morning and I immediately go to my Bleacher Report app and I flip on the link that gets me right to the Cubs and I read all the news about the Cubs and that's the first and foremost thing on my mind is what are the Cubs doing today? It's the off season, it's free agent time. Hey, Cubs convention just started this week. I wonder what they're going to say. I wonder what they're going to do. And I start, and that, that my life revolves around that. Then guess what? I'm not just a servant to the Cubs, I'm a servant to my phone as well. Serving the technology. I, I, my, my world is centered on that. We need to have our lives. If we are truly Christ-centered people, we become his servant. If we're not Christ-centered people, we can't be his servant. We'll be serving something else. So we must be Christ-centered. If you're spirit-filled, we are spirit-filled people, we say. It's the Spirit that enables us to serve Him. That's the beauty of post-Pentecost. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit now leading within us. You know, I always like to say in the Old Testament, we start with, you know, God, God went and approached Him through the prophets, spoke to Him. He was above and He was distant. He was far. And He said, this is okay, but it'd be better if I walked among them. And the incarnation and Jesus walking God, walking among us. And so that's pretty good. I'm walking with Him, but they still leave they still fall away they still come up short they still deny knowing who i am and so you know what would be really good how about if i just live within them that's the story that's what god has done he was there he was beside now he's inside closer and closer and closer restoring us restoring us in right relationship so if we're spirit-filled that's what enables us to serve him what what enables us is not knowing the right answers what enables us is not having been in church so long that we can do church without god what allows us to be a servant is him living within us. The spirit enabling us to make the right decision, to be nudged to do the right thing, to be nudged to be his and his only. So we're spirit-filled. That's what enables us to serve him, to be a servants. If we're a servants, then we want to do the same thing he did. We want to accomplish what the master wants. And for God so loved the world, he sent his son. Jesus said, I came to save, to seek and save the lost. So if that's the master's plan, if that's what God wanted to do, then that is the plan. That's what I'm going to execute on. I'm going to live my life in such a manner, enabled by the Holy Spirit, that people are drawn to him. That I lift him up as the only true God. I lift him up as the one who came and died for sins and preached the gospel. That your sins are forgiven. 
And I bring that to bear, and, and I bring it before people because I want to be like him. I want to be doing the Father's will. And the Father's will is that all should be saved, that none should perish. So that's got to be my plan. That's got to be my game plan. That's got to be my heart's desire because the God lives inside of me. Holy Spirit lives inside of me and enables me and helps me to serve him by trying to reach out to those that are lost. Not other things happen. We as Christians, we talk about our Sunday and Wednesday evenings, we encourage one another. But my end-all, be-all goal is this. Someone is lost and dying in sin, and I need to do whatever I can to tell them and let them know that there is a God who loved them so much that he came to seek and save them. And what he's done for them already, what he will do for them, and what he can do right now. That's what we're after. That is our vision, our goal. You see, sometimes we forget. There's a little little chorus we we talked about today in Sunday school, and Tay and I talked about it. We were listening to uh, Gospel Station this morning on the radio, and I had to pause the song because it hit me that oftentimes we sing songs that try to remind us. And this is a particular song. I'll throw it under the bus. It's okay because I sing it. We've sang it here. It's, it's all right. It's not controversial. It talks about how much he loves us, how much he loves us. And if we're not careful, when we think about him loving us, we try to put it in the context of what we're seeing right now. What is my life like? Oh, let me, let, me how much, let me tell you how much God loves me. God loves me so much he put a wonderful woman in my life. God loves me so much he, he blessed me with where I was born and where I live. You know, we got that phrase, right? American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. Is that a phrase still get kicks around out there? I remember that growing up. Bumper stickers all over the place. That and keep on trucking. I don't know what your bumper stickers look like anymore. But we talk about how, the, how, the, our, our, the, how I know God loves me. How I know God loves me is by all the things I can see around me. And I want to tell you, folks, if we're not careful, we'll start to buy into that. But it's wrong. Here's how I know how much God loved me. He died on a cross for me. Everything else here is gravy, folks. Whatever I experience here in my physical life, this temporal life is gravy or whatever you want to call it. But it's not how he loves me. How he loves me is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He has done everything to demonstrate his love. I'm careful when I pray that I thank God because of who he is. Because the outcomes of my desires on this earth are irrelevant. Considering the love of God that sent him to die on a cross that I might have forgiveness of sins. And when I start saying, well, you know what? It's going to have to be a wonderful outcome for Ox, my father-in-law, in the hospital. It's going to have to be a good outcome. It's going to be the right outcome that I want in order for me to say that God loves me. No! God loves me because he died on a cross for me. And he sent his son to die on that cross. And then he sent the comforter to live within me so that when things are good, I praise him. When things are bad, I praise him. And I give him glory for who he is. And it's secondary to what else is going on outside my body. You see, that's a change of how the world thinks. A lot of us think, you know, we we think Old Testament. Well, something's going on. Something's wrong going on in your life. Hmm. Well, who sinned? Was it the father or was it the son? Somebody sinned if they're having those problems. And I want to tell you, that's not new. It's not even old. It's it's current. There are people in this world that struggle because they think God's love is supposed to be evident and based on the outcome they desire right there in that moment. The reality of God has to be something they can see tangible in their life. But the reality of God is simply this. He came to seek and save the lost, and he already made the way, and the sins have been taken care of when he died on an old rugged cross for us. The gospel message, the reality sets in for us. The reality changes. We're compassionate. We serve as the master serves. Gave everything up. God puts people in our lives so that we can, the word is sacrifice, but I don't think it's a good word. 
the, the phrase that, we do, that I don't really care for all that much, what would Jesus do? I, I don't want to compare what he would do. I just want to be obedient to him. I want to hear him nudge me in the right direction and be obedient to him. I want to serve as the master would serve. Wherever Jesus went, where there was needs, he met needs as he could. That's what he does. That's what he did. What needs are around me that I can meet? You know, sometimes it's driving down the road and seeing somebody walking and putting them in your car and carrying them where they're going. Sometimes it's, you know, somebody you know, trying to get their groceries out to the car and you take their groceries for them. Sometimes it's, you know, at the store the other day when we had to, you know, there were no buggies at, at, at Publix. People were waiting on buggies, waiting on baskets, about letting people go ahead of you. Being in the checkout line and seeing that person hunt that short line and, hey, you can go ahead of me. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's changing a tire on the side of the road. Maybe it's a phone call. Maybe it's a note written. Maybe it's something in your life, but it's serving as God would serve. And here's the idea. If you're not walking close to him, you don't know. You're just guessing. Don't guess. Trust him. We're compassion. We serve as he serves. Compassion is a present action in our lives. And we're generous. And I wanted to put this in here today because I think this is missing in our lives some. We need to be generous with the love that he lavished upon us. I said it a few minutes ago to make sure I could get your mind back to it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Scripture tells us that we were once enemies of God, and yet he loved us. We weren't believers, and he loved us. We didn't even like him, and he provided a way for us to be reconciled unto him. That is a lavishing of love upon us when we realize it. But too many of us want to go, oh, well, I was already good. I, 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 let, let me tell you, I, I was raised up in the church, and I really don't even know what I was saved from. Let me help you. You were saved from an eternity in hell. That's what you were saved from. Let me help you out. I, I fear for folks that don't know what they were saved from. You need to understand there was judgment coming, and he saved you from that. Praise God, he put you in a place where you were raised up in the church and always were in the church, and, and maybe you never did anything wrong, ever. Whew. Perfect like Jesus. Okay, good for you. At some point, you woke up and realized, I needed to love him more than anything else. At some point, you had to realize what he did for you, the love that he lavished upon you. And so what we need to do, if we're going to be his servants, if we're going to be his followers, then we need to be generous, not just financially. We need to be generous with the love that has been lavished upon us. In God's eyes, I was unlovable, but he made a way for me to be lovable. He did that. He changed that. And therefore, I'm going to love the unlovable. I'm going to lavish love upon those who, brace yourselves, don't deserve the love. I'm going to love my, en love my enemies. The scripture tells us that anybody can love their friends. But when you love your enemies, you love those who hate you. That's the call. That's the kind of love God has for us. That's the God that lives within us. That's the God that directs us. That's the servant God loves those who hate. And you say, well, boy, I don't know about that. Well, let's just go back to the cross. On the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. If that's not love for your enemies, I don't know what is. I can tell you this, I have never been nailed to a cross. I've never been beaten and drug out of town for things I've said in support of God. I, I've, I've been mocked. I, mean, I got a wife and kids, so I've been mocked. I got an older brother, I've been mocked. You know. But no one ever cried for me to die. The love that was lavished is the love that lives inside of us. We're generous with that. We want to be a servant. We want to walk with him. We want to be obedient to him. We want to do his will. The question for us today is this. Do you really want to be his servant? Do you really want to be a servant of the one true God?
the one who died for you? Do you want to be his? My mind always, always goes to this idea that once, the scripture says, once I was a slave to sin, and now I'm a slave to righteousness. Sometimes I think we want to go from being a slave to sin to a slave to ourselves. That's not sin. And, and later on, uh, I got to do away with that slave word. I need, to, I need to abolish that word. It has such negative connotation, I don't want it to be that way. But I want to tell you, folks, I am willingly in chains for Jesus Christ. Willingly obedient, willing to be his slave. Whatever he desires is what I want. I, I want to be his I don't want my own will to reign. I want his will to reign. Whatever he desires and whatever he wants is what I want. And therefore, I'm not ashamed of the scripture that tells me I used to be a slave to sin. And let me go and help you out here. When you say you're a slave to yourself or you're not a slave to sin, but you're not a slave to him, then guess what? You're still a slave to sin. Only two camps here, folks. Goes back to, you know, back in the fall, I told you, I did three sermons in a row and there are two choices. Still two, two choices. So nothing's changed in 2020. There's not a third option for you. Either it's sin or it's him. Either I'm living a self-centered life or a God-centered life. So what's it going to be? Do you want to be a servant for him? It's a good life. It's good. Three of us think it's a good life. The rest of everything, he's on the floor. We should be getting close to done. I want to tell you, be his servant today. That's good. A lot of y'all know it. I joke about the three of us. A lot of y'all know it because I know your lives. I want you to leave here today knowing that you're his servant. And it's not, it's not displayed by this moment of what's going on in your life. Just like, just like Jesus abandoned, rejected, and nailed to a cross, it looked like he failed. It just looked like it. But he was being obedient to God in the moment. Some of us, if it's not you, you know somebody who's going through a time. And it doesn't look like it should or like you want it to. But it doesn't change who God is, what he did, what he's doing, and what he will do. You're going to make it through. Let's stand for prayer. The question is simple this morning. We're, I'm not going to have Dora Lee come and play or anything. I'm just going to, in the quietness of this moment, the quietness of this moment, I just want you to know that the question is on the table. You want to be a servant or not? I just want you to answer that question while I pray. I want you to go from this place knowing that you're his. That the future, everything else that's held in his hand, how it all looks at the end of the day is in his hand, not yours, not anybody else's. Be his servant. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Isaiah. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit that lives within us. We thank you for the desire that you had, the love that you had, that called out to us, changed our lives, and made us your servants. Lord, my prayer today is that each one here would be a willing servant of Jesus Christ. Each one here would be obedient to you in all things. Each one here would know your vast, great love that we would know and we would trust in the peace that washes over us. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray your blessings upon each one here, the families they represent. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you guide us, direct us, 
Find us loving you and desiring to be your servants always and continually. Help us to see opportunities to share the love that's been lavished upon us. Give us grace and peace and mercy to carry forward from this place. Guide and direct us. Bring us back together again that we might rejoice in the power of your Holy Spirit that makes us one. And we give you praise always because you're the only one worthy. Amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.